Hey guys, I'm back with round five from the US Amateur Team West. Uh, so in round five, I was playing against National Master Rochelle Wu. Uh, I actually played her not too long ago in the Bay Area International uh, earlier this year. Um, and uh, so this was basically a rematch like one month later. So in that game, we had a King's Indian. In this game, she goes for 1e4. Uh, and this is actually a total surprise for me because I thought she was just a d4 player and I wasn't expecting her to play e4. Um, so I thought for a little while and I ended up going with this move, knight to c6, which I've been playing a little bit uh, here and there, that I think is at least playable and it definitely leads to very interesting and unbalanced positions. So I figure it's a good choice when you're playing for a win with black uh, against an e4 player. Um, so she goes d4, d6, and the idea behind this line is essentially to go into a perk uh, with a very early move knight c6. Uh, and this is kind of provoking white into pushing d5, where in most cases the knight simply jumps back to b8, but eventually gets to use um, some of the squares like c5 and e5 that white gives up with the d5 advance. Uh, so it's, I would say, like a hyper-modern style of playing, because black is often giving up a lot of time and space to achieve this, but uh, the idea is you you kind of provoke your opponent into taking some space so that you get counterplay against it later. Um, White goes for a more modest setup in this game with bishop d3, which I think is quite reasonable. I went g6, c3, bishop g7, and now h3. Uh, another very logical move, stopping bishop g4, um, and just keeping a healthy space advantage for white. So I castled, and uh, she played bishop e3. Normally white just castles in this position, and I don't know too much about the theory here, basically black plays e5 and then at some point we might play rook e8 or we might play knight h5 and go for some uh, like king side play very similar to the the king's indian actually um but she delays castling with bishop e3 which i thought was interesting because uh, i wasn't quite sure if if she was intending to castle queen side or, or do what but after some thought I, I played e5 i realized there's no reason not to make this move um and then she pushes d5 I think white kind of has to because I'm already threatening to play d5 and equalize in the center, so this is really the only way white can, can fight for an edge. Uh, and now I decided to play knight b8 as is kind of typical for the system, but probably knight e7 was just better um, because with this move I'm threatening to play knight takes d5 and then e4. So white is kind of forced to play c4. And then we essentially have a king's indian where white hasn't exactly chosen the, the most aggressive setup, especially the bishop on d3, I think, can be a little strange in, in this position. Um, so I think black could just play like knight d7, among other moves, and then f5, and just get the typical king's indian play going. Uh, I mean, essentially, we, yeah, we've kind of transposed to a uh, classical system in the king's indian now. Um, so, yeah, I think that would have been better, but okay, I chose knight b8. Now white isn't obliged to play c4, although I think that would still be a reasonable move. Uh, instead, white played queen d2, which I definitely thought was a little bit unusual because normally this move is connected with bishop h6, but I don't think bishop h6 is a move white really wants to play here since black is the one with kind of a passive dark squared bishop. And if white isn't really getting such a serious kingside attack, then usually this uh, this trade favors black. Um, so. Yeah, I was definitely fine with bishop h6 if that was going to happen. Uh, so I just played knight bd7. Then white goes knight a3. I think this was a little bit dubious. I think, again, better would have been to play c4 uh, and knight c3. Just kind of a more natural development and, and going into a king's indian position. Um, but knight a3, I guess it's it's more ambitious. It's trying to develop the knight possibly to, to c4. Uh, but, okay, it's hard to see where exactly the knight is going from there. Um, after some thought, I realized I should play c6 here, because I'm threatening to take on d5, and I'm really actually putting a lot of pressure on white center. Uh, if white takes, then I can recapture and play for a couple ideas, mainly knight b6 and, and d5 or d5 right away, um, and it seems like black is just getting a very active position in the center. So white kind of has to play c4 and, and support the pawn on d5, but then... The question is, why is the knight on, on a3? It really would rather be on c3, I think, here. Um, 
But okay, now I, I thought for a little while trying to figure out what to do. I didn't want to take on d5 just yet because then this would actually justify white's knight on a3 quite well and the knight could immediately become useful on c4. Uh, and I didn't want to play c5 either, at least not yet, because uh, then the knight could jump in with knight b5 uh, and knight c3 this way. Um, and then, yeah, I wasn't sure if I'm really happy to, to have my pawn on c5 here or not because it, it is kind of giving white uh, an easier target on the queen side. Um, so, after some thought, I played a flexible move, queen e7. Analyzing it after the game, I think knight e8 would have been better. Uh, just to get on with the kingside counterplay with f5. And I think black has a, a really healthy position. Um, but okay, I play queen e7. And white goes bishop c2. Um, I think this move is actually quite interesting because black was starting to take on d5. And play knight takes d5, followed by e4. Um, winning back the piece. So white kind of prophylactically gets uh, out of the way of that. Um, and then I also realized white might have a threat here to actually play d takes c6, b c6, and then bring a rook to d1 and just try to pick up the d6 pawn. Which might not be that annoying, but for instance after a move like knight h5, which I was strongly considering, I really wasn't sure about um, what I would do in this position, because white is threatening to take on d6, and I don't have a good way to defend it. Um, if I play knight f4, I think white can take and then take on d6. And yeah, the position is very messy because I can even take on b2 at the end. Um, and maybe this is fine for black because the darkster bishop is so strong. But I really wasn't sure and I didn't want to go into like a messy end game um, without really being confident about my chances. Um, so Eventually, in this position, I decided on knight c5, which is a pretty forcing move um, because I'm hitting the e4 pawn and actually bas basically forces white to capture on c5 and give up the dark square bishop. Um, so I think this was kind of a, a double-edged decision because um, on the one hand, I'm getting the dark square bishop. On the other hand, I'm allowing white to, to double my pawns. Uh, and then after dc6, I'm most likely going to have to recapture bc6 and get these ugly uh, double pawns on the c-file. So I have bad memories of this kind of structure from uh, a game I played in Gibraltar against Tumpy Conero, um, where I got doubled a pawns in the position and in the King's Indian, uh, where white did a bishop for, for knight exchange, and my pawn structure was just way too weak. Uh, so I, I really wasn't sure about going into this, but I, I figured there are a couple of key differences and that I shouldn't shy away from it. Number one, in that previous game, white gave up their light squared bishop, which is kind of their, their worst bishop, and not their dark squared bishop, which uh, is a much uh, more useful piece. Um, secondly, in that game, I got doubled a pawns, which are particularly useless. Um, but here, for instance, if we play dc6, bc6, uh, the c pawns are actually quite useful in that they're controlling a lot of squares in the center. So positionally, while the pawns are weak, they are quite useful uh, from a strategic point of view. Um, so, yeah, actually, I think it was the right call, and I think black is doing uh, just fine here. After d takes c6, which was played in the game, um, I really just should have played b takes c6, and this was my original intention, just to play the structure. Uh, and, yeah, analyzing after the game, it turns out black is just doing very well here. Um, because I have a very easy plan of playing knight h5, knight f4, to put some pressure on the king side. I have the open b file for this rook. My bishop can go to e6. So all of my pieces have uh, a lot of potential in the position, whereas from White's point of view, um, her pieces aren't doing quite as much in the position, and it's hard to really target the, the C-pawns. Um, so yeah, objectively, I think Black is, is already better. Um, so okay, I should have gone for that. Instead, once DC6 was on the board, I realized I had a, a second opportunity. I could throw in the move Rook to D8, um, with the idea that if the queen moves away, then I could take this pawn, and I've kind of gotten a free tempo with rook to d8. Uh, but then I noticed that rook d8, white can take on b7, uh, intermediate move. Because if I take on d2, white takes the rook and makes a new queen and is going to be up material. But I actually, I don't know, I somehow I was feeling a little bit uh, ambitious here. Um, because I just figured, okay, after rook d8 takes takes, I can just sacrifice the pawn, I'll be a pawn down, but my bishop gets on the open diagonal, I get rid of one of my ugly double pawns, 
and so I should have tons of compensation. Uh, and I think black has some compensation there, but but probably not not enough objectively. Um, so I really just should have recaptured the pawn and then just play the position from here, bishop e6, rook b8, and, and so on. And yeah, I think black is doing well. Um, so I play rook d8, and then after some thought, um, she ends up taking on b7, which I think was a good decision because uh, objectively, if white just moves the queen away, they're going to be worse without much upside here. So after c takes b7, uh, at least white is grabbing a pawn, and yeah, it's not clear that black is getting a ton of compensation after queen e2. Um, so, okay, here I end up going for knight h5, this is kind of my idea just to, to play for activity, I want to get knight f4 in, and then f5, uh, but g3, you know, white finds the right move here, just taking control over the square, not fearing the, the weakness uh, of the h-pawn, um, because if white needs to, they can even play king f1, king g2, and just defend this pawn the slow way without, without even needing to castle. Um, and yeah, it doesn't seem clear that black is actually breaking through in the position and, and creating enough threats. Um, so I played f5. I think there's not much else to do. And uh, if white takes on f5, then of course it gets very dangerous because uh, the files open up and I can immediately consider a move like e4, where I'm not necessarily threatening the knight right away because the queen is hanging, but I am threatening bishop takes b2 which would win a lot of material, and of course the queen is starting to, to move somewhere with tempo where the knight will be under attack. Or simply g takes f5 and, and black is getting a, a really active position. So of course e takes f5 is not a great option, but if white just keeps the blockade on the e4 pawn, actually it's, it's not clear um, how black breaks through. So I was actually expecting castles during the game, and I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do here. I think most likely I was just going to take on e4, uh, bishop e4, and eventually play knight f6, and um, go for this position where if white backs the queen up, then I can play e4, uh, and I think black is getting some compensation here because the knight on a3 is still out of the game, the bishop is now opened up, and so I have a lot of open lines for my pieces. Um, or white could take on e5 in this case, and then the send game black would be two pawns down, but after a move like knight e4, um, I think black has a lot of compensation because b2 is hanging, of course e5 is hanging, uh, f4 is not really advisable because the g3 pawn falls, so white would definitely have some, some problems to solve. Though objectively the computer says white can still get some small edge after after knight c6 with, with very very concrete play. So yeah, objectively if white had found castles it would have been, I think, difficult to fully prove the, the compensation, although I think it's still within within reasonable range. Uh, but in the game, in this position, after f5, white ends up playing knight b5. Which I definitely understand, because white is trying to get the knight back into the game, and if white can get knight c3, knight d5, then black's position will be uh, extremely bad. Um, but it also takes away the tempo that white needs to, to castle in this position to, to really consolidate. So um, now I immediately felt much better about my position, so I played f takes c4, bishop takes c4, I traded and knight f6. And now I figure since the king is on e1, this is probably an even better version for black. Uh, I was definitely expecting queen e2 here, where my idea would be to play e4, and then the knight isn't hanging yet, so probably white should just castle here. And then black has a lot of moves. We have something like queen d7 or rook e8, basically just defending the queen and renewing the threat on the knight. Um, and I think black yeah, it can definitely pose some problems, because, for instance, knight g5, like, this active move just runs into h6, and this knight has nowhere to go. So, the knight has to go somewhere else, eventually black might even be able to break with e3, or bring the second rook in, and, yeah, I think black definitely gets um, some some real play here. But actually, in the game, I, I was quite surprised um, that in this position, my opponent was actually thinking for a little while, and uh, I realized she was probably thinking about queen takes e5 which looks like it's grabbing a second pawn, but I, I had already seen that it's just running into queen b7, where white is just uh, in, in huge trouble. The knight on f3 is hanging, and black you know, creates this sort of rook e8, pinning the, the queen to the king. Um, but yeah, after some time, she ends up taking the pawn, and, and I think she was just caught up in, in trying to evaluate um, the end game after queen takes e5, knight takes e5. Because here, white's two pawns up, and it's not clear if black is getting uh, enough compensation, because rook e8 
can be met with f4 and and, and white is um, definitely surviving there and it's two pawns so if i don't win them back uh soon i'm, I'm just gonna be in a, a pretty bad end game um but yeah i think she just missed uh the chance to look for other ideas here because if you see queen b7 from white's point of view you really don't want to allow this um because now white's king on e1 is just getting caught in, in the crossfire um so yeah after this it's it's basically uh over because the nine on f3 is hanging and of course the rook on h1 is hanging with check uh, and again, we have this threat of rook e8. So white played queen f4, which is kind of the only sensible move. Um, and actually black has a couple of excellent options here. So this would be maybe a good time to pause the video and try to figure out uh, what black should do here. Um, okay, so I think a really simple move actually would have been a6. And I was considering this one, but I, I don't know. I think there was a lot of ways to, to play the position at this point. Um, and the problem for white is whenever the knight goes back, we can simply play queen takes b2, and white just has no way of defending both of these pieces. Um, actually, there is queen c1, but okay, white's position is uh, is pretty hopeless, because we're going to have rook e8 check, and, and the king is, is on the run, and I think we can even... Um, yeah, I think there's just <laughs> a ton of a ton of play in the position, can even play queen b7 at some point. Um, so that looked... Yeah, very, very bad for white, but um, I like the move I played in the game. I just went with rook d3, kind of uh, straightforward, uh, because I'm hitting the knight, and the problem is, uh, again, the knight is pinned, so he can't move. Um, white can play king e2, but this runs into a, a pretty nice tactic, rook takes f3. And so because of this, I figure this line was just going to be the cleanest. Uh, after queen takes f3, rook e8, White is forced to, to part ways with the queen, and uh, it's basically over. So now I have a queen and bishop for two rooks, and uh, because white's king on e3 is still in danger, I think it's just just zero saving chances for white. And you actually just try to finish the game as uh, cleanly as possible. So I started bishop h6 check, which I think is accurate, because if king e2 trying to run to safety, black will have queen e4 check, and white's king has to step on the back rank, which allows me to grab the first rook and then the second rook. Um, so after bishop h6, white is forced to play f4, but yeah, now the queen just gets in with, with tempo. Uh, I play queen c2 check, king f3, queen d3 check. And white actually resigned here, because after queen d3, uh, if king f2, then the knight comes into e4 with check, and I'm just taking here. And if king g2, then... Queen e2 check, king g1, and it's, yeah, just the very sad side for the king, but easiest would be probably just something like queen f3 and, and just taking all of white's kingside pawns next. Um, so, yeah, I think it was definitely not a not a clean game, but, um, yeah, I, I really, I, I don't know what to say about that, <laughs> that pawn sacrifice I made, um, because I think up until this point, I'd, I'd played quite okay, and then I was just... A little bit too too ambitious with with rook d8. Uh, I mean the sacrifice ended up working out, but objectively, had white just castled in this position, I think if anything, black would just be struggling uh, to to make a draw. Um, so I, I was definitely lucky. Uh, first off, with this move, knight b5, kind of a little bit slow, and then of course with queen takes e5 is definitely kind of a, an unforced uh, blunder. Um, but okay, you know I'll take the win. And uh, actually, the, the team ended up drawing this match. Uh, we won on the top two boards, lost on the bottom two boards. Um, so after this round, we were on four and a half out of five with, uh, with one round to go. So I'll be covering the, the drama of the final round in the next video. And until then, uh, take care.